This is Mitch, and welcome to the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast. Today, we're doing something a little different. We're talking to Kathy Takaro, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, living a life where she was very abused in many ways, and then uh, at one point, homeless at age 42 and a drunk, and down and out, uh, and she turned it all the way around. And when I heard her story, I told Julie, I said, you know, I think this is going to fit under the motivational, inspirational side of this podcast, because there's people out there that may be going through things similar, and they need to hear this lady's mm. story. And if we can help change one person's life with this story, or, or, or even Kathy herself can get involved with her book, um, Big Dream Workbook, then we, want, we need to do it. So we're here today with Kathy. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me as a guest on your show. It's a real honor. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, this story goes a little further, folks. She, she leaves a career in nursing and ends up being a major, <laughs> major big equipment operator at a mine. I mean, like, just takes a, not, I don't you can't even call it a 180. Like, she jumps planets for a career. And so, um, there has to be a lot of fear scattered in and out of all of this, all of this from the, from oh, the yeah. abuse and the obstacles to the changing a career and becoming a whole different person. And so her workbook is on overcoming fear. And uh, I've done a solo cast on fear. Um, fear is a very real thing. And, and, but you got to look at it a certain way or fear will kick your ass up and down the street for the rest of your life. And you just can't have right. it. You got to stop it somewhere. Right, Kathy? That's absolutely correct. It's all, all a right, give mindset. Us, give us a little bit of your background. Okay. Well, uh, there's a lot to say, but I'll just kind of keep it short and sweet. I'll try. A lot of um, sexual abuse as a, ch as a small child. I was in a foster home. My very first memory is a hand covering my mouth for me not to scream. And um, that kind of stayed with me my entire life. It's as if I had this invisible hand preventing me from having a voice in life. I would internalize everything. So it was very, I mean, um, very difficult for me to even be a speaker and even start to get out of the shell of mine. I, um, I was in a foster home until I was four and then my mom came back and got me. She had remarried and I have two older sisters. So there's three of us. And my stepfather, she thought he, she had married you know, well, he was uh, the town genius sort of thing. Everybody looked up to him and turns out behind closed doors, he was a real monster. Uh, tons of physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence. Uh, just, uh, I grew up, my chapter one in my book, Dream Big, is actually starting with, uh, uh, I, I used to pretty much live in the doghouse because that was the, my safe place, you could say. Um, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd have conversations with God trying to figure out, well, you know, if you're such a loving God, how could you let all these things, these horrible things happen to, to, to us? And I just didn't understand. And to make it worse, he took the dog out back and he shot it. So I was just, you know, completely alone, very, lots of neglect. My mom was very overwhelmed um, mentally, emotionally. So she wasn't available there. And so anyway, going on through life, uh, my very first boyfriend, he had, uh, because I'd already grown up in fear and all this violence, he, he raped me. And then at 15, I was attacked again. And nobody, the police were involved in that attack, but nobody had ever, we decided, there's no charges that were pressed. And the way my family dealt with it is that you just don't talk about it. So you internalize all that. Um, I became a model when I was uh, 17, 16, 17. And I was down in Miami and I was drugged and raped after, by, by the photographer after a photo shoot. I was drinking diet seven up because it's not fattening, right? <laughs> and um, he took me out to after the shoot to meet people in the industry downtown Miami. And one one minute I'm drinking a diet seven up, the next minute uh, I I wake up and he's on top of me. Anyway, uh, he was telling me it's my fault that I wanted it and all this stuff. So I internalized all that again, and then um, I went to New York model. I modeled there for a while, and I ended up. Uh, leaving going back to Montreal and I, I, I was gang raped at three o'clock in the morning after my shift at the, the local restaurant that I worked at and that sent me over the edge I ended up with three suicide attempts I was on a bridge I swallowed pills um, I, I, I didn't at the time 
didn't think of calling the police. I was so, I felt so dirty and so ashamed. And I figured that, you know, it'd be, he said, or they said, yeah, he, I didn't have proof and just, you know, my clothes were torn, my bag was gone. I didn't, you know, it's just, yeah. So I, I didn't do anything with it. And instead my idea of dealing with it is that I, cross Canada. I took, I went as far as I could. I got away from my family. I took 150 bucks. I had a suitcase. <laughs> I hopped on the train and I went from Montreal, Quebec, all the way to uh, Alberta in the Rocky Mountains. And I started over and all I pretended that, you know what, I'm in a new, I got a new life here. We're going to pretend it never happened. Life is all good. Just forget about it. Whatever. A lot of people say that with the, their, their personal trauma. I mean, it was a long time ago. So what I did is instead I put myself through school. I ended up, uh, I put myself through nursing school and every pretended everything's fine because now when I graduated in 1998, I got this great career. I mean, oh my God, I, I, I realized, I, I started believing you know, that I actually was smart instead of being told as a child how stupid and ugly and useless and you know, a waste of skin and you'll never amount to nothing. And yet here I am graduated from nursing. So it, it was a big moment for me. However, the problem being is that all that trauma that I hadn't addressed with is still inside. It's still, you know, you put it and you lock it away in that vault that you got and to deal with later. Well, I didn't deal with it. So what that did, it started that, that internal wound became infected and that infection started uh, acting out, coming out in, in behaviors, in things because I couldn't cope with it because now I got all this low self-esteem, even though I'm a nurse, um, I'm still carrying that around. So all of a sudden now it's coming out. I started to drink. Um, I started making poor choices. I, uh, I started working, taking care of everybody else, not taking care of me. I ended up in seven years of intense domestic violence. Uh, the men, I, there was two men involved. One went, one first, and then I went, the next guy was even worse. I was stalked, beaten, raped. I was strangled three times to the point of losing consciousness. I lived with a shovel on my porch as a reminder of what I was going to be buried with. Um, I, I lost a baby due to uh, violence. I mean, it just went on. Like he, it was absolutely horrible. And to try and in the midst of all that, I am still nursing. I'm in and out of women's shelters while I'm nursing. What does that say? I mean, that alone shows you how unwell I was because it was super easy to take care of everybody else's problems. I mean, you, you got a wound, you got cancer, you got this, you got that. I can deal with that. But to look at my own trauma was a different story. So I had a 10 year old daughter at that time and uh, she, I ended up sending her to her dad's for safety reasons so she could live there. And while I try and figure out how I'm gonna escape this guy, and I did manage to escape in 2007. And I, I say escape because that's exactly what, what it was. He literally, he had, uh, can I be a little bit of graphic? <laughs> he sure, sure. had his, he, I, I came in one day from my nursing uh, shift and I just must have looked at him wrong. I just kind of, whatever. And I turned around and in turning around, he was on me so fast. And he had me pinned on the floor. He's hitting, he's punching me in the face with one hand. He's strangling me with the other. And his face is like just his right here. And his veins are popping and he's, he's yelling, I'm gonna take your bloody battered body, put you in a truck, tie you up, roll you down a hill and burn you alive, you stupid, useless, you know. He says, we're, I was up in the Yukon uh, by Alaska then. And he says, we're in the Yukon, no one will ever find you. And then do you doubt me? And at that lap moment, um, like I couldn't speak and I, and I passed out and I just remember tears coming down and I'm trying to, you know, well, there's nothing I could do. He, 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 had my, he had me pinned and I wake up and I couldn't speak because he had strangled me so hard. But what I could do, he had left and I got a phone and I called, I kind of croaked my way out of there and I, I had a friend buy me a ticket. So I got on a bus and I went, it's this 36 hour bus ride. Now this is where it gets critical because this is what I, um, a lot of people will be able to relate with me on this. During that bus ride, because I had 36 hours, right? And I escaped him. And I called, I made a few phone calls. One was for a previous employer. He said, Kathy, as soon as you get here, you have a job, get here. And then I called a friend of mine. I said, look, I need a place to stay. He says, I have a basement apartment, you come. You know, and I'll give you a place rent free for a while. So now, in that moment, very critical because 
I know I have a roof over my head. I have a job. That means I can feed myself. I, you know, I can pay my bills. I can get moaning. What I did is I, I, I shifted my mind, even though my face is out to here, like all black and blue in my mind, I'm like, you know what? I'm fine. I'm good. I got this. It doesn't matter. We're just going to leave that back there and we're going to keep moving on and keep trudging on. You're a survivor. You're a tough girl. I put that mask on that so many people wear every day. Well, in doing so, yes, I had a job. Yes, I had a roof over my head. My mental health was a mess because not only did I have all the trauma from all the rapes and all the, all that, but now I just have seven years of incredible violence that I put on that mask and pretend that I'm fine. Well, you can only do that for so long. So I, I managed to do that for a whole year and I put one foot in front of the other, you know, you keep trubbing, you got bills to pay, you got this, you got that. And I did that until one day I got, I show up at work. I got 10 patients to take care of, you know, that's a, that's a lot. And I'm on the night shift. And, I sh and I'm tired, like I am mentally, emotionally, I, I'm just very, very tired. What I did, is I, I get to work and I look at my sheet and I couldn't read the words. I could not see the words on the paper. And it was like, it was Chinese mumbo jumbo on the, on the form. And I knew right then and there that I was done. Like, there's no way that I can continue pretending that I'm okay when obviously I'm not. So I quit my job, I turned around, I went from the medical unit, I ran down to the psychiatric unit, and in between the two, I lost my mind. <laughs> it's as if 40 years of repressed pain and trauma and all that stuff, it just came bu bubbling out like a geyser. And I get down to the psych unit and I'm pounding on the door. I'm like, let me in, let me in. They actually called security, get her out, get her out. <laughs> So security came to drag me and I went to the emergency and it was the first time and I'm 40 by now that I actually told someone everything. I had never said it to I, my, even my own mother didn't know anything. Right. So I told, I, I told him everything and he says, Kathy, and I expected him to give me some happy pills, you know, some, some good drugs to make me happy. And he says, there's no amount of pills that's going to fix you. He says, number one, pills don't work like that. And number two, you need to quit drinking you need to address all these issues. So he sent me to treatment in 2008. And that was the first time that I actually realized um, the lady had me take a, like a bottle of water, just like this. And on every little line, she had me write a specific event that a traumatic event that, that affected me. So I did that. And I thought it was a stupid thing to do, but I, I did it anyway. But what I realized as I'm writing down on every line, I had some on this side of the sheet, some on this side of the sheet. I had to flip it over. I had to write on that side. And that's when it sunk in that, oh my God, like I got a lot of stuff here. <laughs> I need to, to deal with that. So, I mean, change doesn't happen overnight. Change takes time. And it took from 2008 to 2012, a, quite a few relapses in there because I mean, I was a wicked alcoholic and it was very difficult for me. I mean, things, trauma, um, it builds in layers. <laughs> so I would release one layer and then, oh my God, I got another, I got something else that I forgot, repressed memories. And then there'd be something else. And then there's something else. So it took a lot of time to deal Were with Were you doing it. this through hypnotism or how, how, no, how are they turning no. this out of you? Um, through, um, the lady at, at when I, when she was doing that, that, that treat, that, that water bottle, uh, worksheet that I did, she said, you know, you're going to need long-term treatment. This is not going to happen in two weeks, right? <laughs> so when I went back to nursing, I went right, right, right back to nursing. And then I ended up losing my job because I'm, a, you know, I drank, I showed up to work drunk, lost my career. And then I uh, ended up, I had three days in chapter eight in my book. I talk about it, three days of inc incredible depression and I, I couldn't move. I couldn't function. And during that time, I had a very powerful spiritual experience where uh, I knew that there was something greater for me to be doing and laying on the couch depressed, wanting to kill myself, it wasn't it. So what happened is my friend came and picked me up and he brought me to detox. And from that detox place, that was the first time that I found out that there was a place just for women where you live there is a faith-based uh, community where you live in a house and there's 25 other women and you, you have your own room, you have your own thing but you work on yourself. You're, you're kind of removed. You live off at $262 a month, but you have a roof over your head. You have three square meals a day. You have counseling 24 seven. And that's what I did for a year. 
And that's how I started to learn slowly about boundaries and codependency and anger management. I mean, she said, Kathy, you need anger management. I, I'm like, no, I don't. I'm like, I'm, I'm one of the nicest people on earth. Like, I'm not angry. <laughs> but anger comes out in different ways. Anger is very sneaky. <laughs> so, yes, I did need anger management. Uh, I had to work on self-esteem. And I had to How take... are you showing your anger? Through the drinking? Well, it, no, through oh, depression, eating uh, disorders, uh, really low self-esteem. And just, um, yeah, it, it attacks different ways. And drinking alcohol, of course, right? So I ended up, uh, I was there for a year, but I mean, like I said, there's a lot of layers. So the, when I, I, when I left there, I thought I was fine, but of course I ended up drinking in two weeks uh, from, from that date. And I managed to go back to nursing for, for a short time. And of course, when I relapsed, then I officially lost. This, by now I'm 42. I officially, my daughter was 16, wouldn't talk to me. She didn't talk to me for two years. Um, she, I lost my career, I lost everything I owned. I ended up on the streets, drunk, like a complete mess, homeless. Uh, it was just, I had slashed my arm in a drunken moment. I mean, I spent three days in ICU, I, like I should be dead, but I, I'm not by the grace of God alone. Um, so what happened is on the seventh day of being homeless, I mean, I, I was even robbed. I had no identification. I literally only had no backpack. I had the clothes on my back, that was it. This guy named Toothless Joe, on the seventh day, he comes up to me and he slaps me on the back. He, he's drunk. And he goes, this is the life. You know, live it. Love it. This big toothless grin. When he did that, it was my, it was my saving moment. It was, I call it a God smack because when he slapped me, it's as if that cloud of depression that I've been carrying around for decades, it just shattered. And I'm looking around my very dismal surroundings and I'm like, oh my God. Like it's all of a sudden I saw crystal clear and I'm thinking, how the heck did I end up here? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm educated. I shouldn't be homeless. I shouldn't, you know, this, this is wrong. So I'm looking at him and I said, what did you just say? And I said, this is not my life. I actually stomped my foot and I said it out loud. I said, this is not my life. I turned around and I went to the hospital. I detoxed again and I went back to that women's place. And I said, I'm not leaving here until I figure this, 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 this out. Right. And two years from Toothless Joe, exactly, I'm standing, the picture on the book, of, on my cover, on, on my book, is I'm standing beside the biggest truck in the world, looking up, I got this big grin, and I, I'm learning how to drive this. In two years, I managed to go from homeless to operating the biggest truck in the world. Like, it was mind-blowing. On the picture, you can't see it, but I'm actually crying because I'm looking up at this thing, and for, for, for the, uh, those that don't know, I drive a two and a half story house. It's a 3,800 square foot truck. It holds 400 tons. The tires are 14 feet high. Um, it's an $8 million vehicle, a Caterpillar 797 heavy haul mining truck. It's, they're massive. So I'm looking up at this pic, this, this truck, and I'm thinking a toothless Joe, right? I'm thinking it's like, how does this even happen? Like, holy crap. So that was seven years ago. Uh, yeah, I have now, I have eight years sober now and um, life has just completely transformed. I can't even begin to tell you how awesome <laughs> my life has changed, but it took a lot of work. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, right? It took a okay, lot so, of work. So let's give me a chance to ask some questions here because okay. it's a great story, but, and, I, and, 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 but just every time you're talking, I'm like, have a billion questions. Um, first one is, okay. <laughs> um, was there one biggest challenge? Can you boil it down to one thing that, that you should have done or should have done earlier? Or would it, if you had it to do over again, is there one thing that would have, would speed things up for you? Yes, press charges. If I had to press charges from a young age, then that would have given me the the confidence and um the belief they'd have made that you I, talk they'd have made you it, talk, yeah right right, right? It, it would have yeah it would have definitely changed things because had it happened again i would have pressed charges again and again and again but i never did i never said anything i never voiced anything until i was 40 right um obviously you're a believer i'm gonna it's not a real stretch right now, but I need your confirmation. Um, God played a 
played was in the whole thing. Absolutely, hundred percent. Okay, but you said something, and I want you said you were asking the question in the doghouse. I want to know what you, what what you found as an answer. Said, if you're such a loving God, why do you let this happen to me? What was what was your what where what answer did you get to that? Well, I don't. I can't really say a specific answer to that, but my understanding is that I mean we have certain things that happen to us that you have that makes us grow and that makes us um, learn from. And I I believe even though as awful as it was, it has empowered me to help so many other people. Like, and I'm talking thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> That's where I was going because. The theory is, is that you're going through all these things, not because you deserve to go through them, because he's trying to make you stronger so that you can um, help everyone involved in the situation, maybe even the person that's doing it to you. Uh, oh, more, more obvious is you're trying to help people that had it done to them. But exactly. In some, have, you ever, have you ever been able to help someone who committed a crime against you? I, to be honest, I haven't even tried. No. Okay. No, no. It, it, it's not like you're expected to or not. Yeah. I was just wondering because sometimes life has weird twists and I yeah. won't be surprised if before it's all over, it comes around, you know, it might happen that way. But, but for sure, you're going out to try to help other people that have had things happen to them. Right. Absolutely. And, and so you do have a place where, where do you, you've come out of this with a mission, right? Absolutely. <laughs> What's the mission? Uh, my, bit, my mission is mainly to have people speak out when something happens to you. Most people keep these secrets for years and years and years. And if I, it, my, my goal is to reach 1 million youth, <laughs> to have them uh, to, to learn to say that it's okay to not be okay and to stand up and speak out about it. I visit schools, I travel all over talking to specific age groups between 13 and, and 17, um, specifically for this. I mean, I go to different countries, I go everywhere to, to talk to the schools for this. Because you if have, I, non, I, have, you, have, you, have you started a nonprofit? Nope, I haven't. It's on, it's on my to-do list. <laughs> well, no, I'm just asking, because I, I mean, I, I know you're yeah. gonna do it. I can, I can feel it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm so, busy. <laughs> I I want everyone to to get a copy of this book, and she's offering, Kathy's offering the first chapter free. It's uh the book is Dream Big Workbook, and the first chapter is on fear, and I think that's where you got to start. I did a solo cast on fear. My yeah. the fears that I had were not nearly as critical as the fears that you had, but the principle is still the same. You have to take what scares you the most and you have to get right up face to face with it. And you have to you do. You have to look it right in the eye and you have to say, okay, we're gonna go brawl in the street and you may kick my ass, fear, but you're not gonna drag me around anymore. And Absolutely. I'm not gonna we're gonna get down to it. And then you find out that your dragons are not nearly as big in real life mm -hmm. as they are in your imagination. It's what that's been my experience in my yes. and I want but I wanna be very humble here and succumb to the fact that I have not been through anything like you've been through. I was scared of couldn't find my place, but honest to God, I had the greatest family in the world and, and we weren't rich and we never they they you know there never was an abundance of money, but we never lacked for anything, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I come from a di very different place, and I'm so grateful for for how things are for me and the, the way that life works out for me. That this podcast is really to help people find where they belong. You want to do it in creative real estate investing? I can help you. My friends can help you. If that's not it, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> Let's go find what it is that you could do to make some money and get up so you can live who you're supposed to be. Uh, I don't care if you pick real estate or not, um, I just want you to find where you belong and get happy and be the person that you're supposed mm -hmm. to be. And it's hard to do when you're living with a gun to your head or, or you're broke, you know, it's hard to go out and be that person. So um, what do you say to people that are struggling? Get back up. 
the struggle is real. It's always going to be there, but you can get back up and keep fighting. There's resources out there. So many, so many resources that are, that are free nowadays and online and available. I mean, for people that say, Oh, I, I have no help. No, that's the problem right there. It's the mindset here, right? If you want the help, you're going to find it. That's that period. End of story because there is help available the determination and you, can't, and you can't stop at this first person that says oh they don't they don't have anything like this in this town don't yeah. you don't stop there besides yeah. that it doesn't have to be in your town i find that you can't stop um at a minimum you have to get three to four no's or, yeah. or you know what I mean? before you change the way you're asking the question or change who you're asking the question to to you know like exactly I, you, you remember when we used to have dial 411 for information <laughs> Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. We would dial and go, hey, you know, I'm looking for Mr. So and so, you know. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a number for him. Just hang up and dial right back. Get a different person. I'm looking for so and so. We don't, we, we don't, he's, we don't have a number for him. Hang up, dial right back. Yeah. We don't have a number for him. Hang up, dial right back. Oh, here he is. I was like, yeah. What the hell? I mean, did the other I agree. Like, give a crap or 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 yeah. are they on the, got a different set of yellow pages or what yeah. i don't know but it was amazing if you called back enough times someone always found the guy's phone number yeah i agree i remember so the model at my <laughs> office is don't even ask me how to you know that you, mitch i can't find so and so what do i do i said well, first of all have you called at least three different people to figure out that question? They say, no. I say, okay, well, call me after you've called three. Then I never yeah. get the phone number. I mean, I never get the call from them because they figure it out, right? Yeah. There is resources. There, there are is. things. Even for the most obscure things in the world doesn't even have to do with this. You can always, there's someone out there. This is a giant world. And with the internet, the way now, I suppose this was much more difficult in your time because oh, yeah, probably the was. internet wasn't what it is today, right? Yeah, it is so different then. But I'm very grateful to be where I'm at today. And like even on my own website, I uh, there's a there's a page of resources. There's a whole list, and I have people from the states now um, emailing me wanting to be on my on my page of resources. So that's awesome, right? So that alone. Um, Keep building the resources. That alone can help yeah. a lot of people. Okay, to yeah. get this free chapter on fear from the oh. Green Big Workbook, I want you to go to reinvestorsummit.com forward slash fearless. All right? Let's, fearless. Can I just explain something on that? Sure. Just a second. Sure. Sure. Okay. The workbook, I don't know if you can see, this is my book, right? Dream big. Is that you, that tiny speck in blue down there by that time? Yeah, yeah, that's me. I don't know if you can kind of see, right? So that's my Holy book, Dream God. Big, okay? So that's, that's my baby that I drive. That's a, that's a bad picture of it. But anyway, so the book has 10 chapters, and each chapter is dedicated to an emotion. So my, my first emotion I've ever felt was fear. That's why, um, and then there's loneliness, and it, it goes on, right? And these are emotions that men, women, anybody can can uh, address, right? Because we all have them. Now, the workbook is came out after this, and I'm only releasing uh, chapter per chapter every couple months. And then what it is, like, uh, um, it goes with the book. So the chapter one on fear, it, there's 20 questions related, to, directly related to fear. I, I have um, uh, kind of like spiritual exercises to stop when the pain gets too much and different ways of, of dealing with it. So then chapter two is on loneliness. It kind of accompanies back and forth. So just so you know. <laughs> okay. So, so it's not something you just read. I mean, this is actually, you can, you can, folks, you can work on this. You can, and yeah, you don't do it in one day. Is there any contact with you or do they have a coach or is there a chance to get a coach or, or they just, uh, need to, when, when they get the books there, they got to, you know, go through the steps on their own. I'm always available. I, I was going to start a coaching um, uh, coaching thing, but the thing is I work uh, on that truck. I work in the mine 16 days at a time and then I'm off for 16. And when I'm in the mine, where I don't have my phone. I don't have my laptop. I only have an hour a day that I do. So it's really hard to coach people if I'm not available, <laughs> right? I but I mean, I can't, I can't be an email. That's about it. So. All right. Well, uh, so, but you are doing what you can do and trying to help people with this book. Um, again, ariinvestorsummit.com forward slash fearless.
and um, go get your workbook. Um, man, I could talk to you probably all day long. <laughs> I, my my hat is off to you. I'm, I'm very I'm very proud of you because uh, there's a, there's a lot of people that that just don't come back from this. No, you know? you're right. You're right. Um, by the way, can I share something with you that's personal? Yes. Please. I quit drinking after 40 years on August the 1st, and I'm eight months, no smoking, no drinking. I quit on the same Good day. Good for August you! Holy and cow! I lost 40, and I lost 45.6 <laughs> pounds and went from 36 waist to 30. Wow! Congrats! <laughs> yeah, you should have seen me. Like, if you'd have been doing this interview eight months ago, I was a real fat ass. <laughs> so, anyway, someone, someone asked me, I don't know if it's relevant to the conversation, but someone <laughs> yesterday they had a bunch of beer and everything, and I went I went and bought the beer. And I'm, I, I don't I really don't struggle with it at all. I can go to the bar. Mm -hmm. I have full bar at my, the ranch. I have a full bar at my house. People drink and smoke around me all the time. It, there's no, it doesn't trigger me. And um, people say, "How is that?" And I say, "You know, I like looking much better and feeling way better mm -hmm. than I want that." Yeah. I won't. Tr I wouldn't trade the way I look and the way I feel right now for a drink. I don't want to trade that, you know. And it was I, I, actually I I put that together yesterday after eight months. Someone asked me, and I didn't have the the answer to that question. So I walked around like, why why is it so easy yeah. for me to turn this down? And it was I appreciate how things are now, and I know that that was quitting those two things, smoking and drinking, was part of the how i got to where i'm at it was a major yeah. thing you can't it's hard to diet or to make any commitments when you're drinking because when you when you get inebriated your willpower goes out the window, window. <laughs> you know yeah uh and, and so all these big plans and goals you have get minimized under the influence if not vanish right they van yeah. your, your goals vanish and yeah. then you they disappear they disappear like when people ask me how how did I go from homeless to driving the truck in such a short time span, it's exactly that. The desire to change my life overruled any fear, any insecurity. Like I knew I was going to change, and that was it. I was going to do whatever it 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 took. And speaking of like fear, I mean, fear will hold people back. I mean, look at obstacles. Let me talk about that for a second. Um, overcoming obstacles of going into a, in a place where mostly men are working and given my trauma, it was a big thing. But the biggest obstacle, uh, sorry, the biggest obstacle I had to overcome was myself, was my mindset of learning how to flip that switch in my mind and say, Kathy, you are either going to stop yourself from, from even trying going for the job or you're going to actually persevere and you're going to kick some ass and you're going to go do it and you're going to excel at it. And I did. Right. You, 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 you made an impression on me, too, like before we started recording the show. Um, you were telling me everything you went through and I made the comment, man, men are just a big sack of bastards. <laughs> and and you said there's plenty of good ones, which showed like a real healing to me. Like you, you yeah. didn't you still you didn't close you didn't shut them all out you know what i mean you didn't no, blanket, no. you didn't blanket uh that gender you know you, which to me is a really big person you know a really big person so, to say it's not everybody it's not every man it's not there's but, good but you know it's there. my work actually that taught me that because for every i work for exxon and for every position that we have in the mind they interview eight people to weed out the attitudes, weed out, you know, the, the egos, the this, the that. Um, and so everybody at the mine, they're like family. I work with the same people for the last seven years. And they're just, they're, they're like me. They're just good, kind. I mean, they're loving, they take care of their families, you know, they do all this. And that is what taught me the most that, you know what, that there's a lot of good guys out there. And, and I love these guys. And they're, they would never hurt a fly in a million years. So it kind of, it, it helped me rebuild my foundation in, in my belief system, right? That not all men are assholes and they're not, they're not all abusive and they're not all, you know, there's a lot of good men, a lot. Do you see a common thread in the men that are good and a common thread in the men that are bad? Um, you know what I see, <laughs> this is going to sound kind of strange, but what I see is uh, an opportunity. So when women 
or, or men, because it goes both ways. When a person is not well mentally, like, and I don't, I don't mean, you know, when you're not well, when you're filled with depression and anxiety and low self-esteem and you got all these things going on, you're not going to pick someone who's well, right? So it's like it feeds one off the other. It's, um, so it's part the, like, it's part my fault for picking a man uh, in that, in, in a poor frame of mind, you know what I mean? And for tolerating the abuse, I should have got out the second somebody, uh, he hit me or the second he started telling me my hair wasn't right. My, 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 my makeup was wrong. The food I cooked was wrong. That is when I should have left, but I didn't. So it kind of, you, you know what I mean? It's not just all their fault. It's also me for, for allowing it to happen. Yeah. So. Hey, can you crank your camera just a little bit? The light Which coming way? in the window is changing. Your... Oh, hang on a second. There, there okay. you go. That's great. <laughs> You're back. I don't know if you can see it right behind me here is my wall of love. It's uh, all my wall from I do a lot of charity work. I work with women in shelters. I do all this for free. I, I speak at schools. I bring supplies. I go to different countries. Um, and uh, they're all a lot of the kids. Uh, they're on my wall. Those are gifts. There's pictures. There's letters. There's. I started a Hands of Hope project uh, back in 2017, and I collected 138 Hands of Hope, and I distributed them down in Grenada. And these kids, oh my God, I had I had them make Hands of Hope for Canada. <laughs> so it was actually super cool. That's my little wall so back there. <laughs> how does um. How, how, how big is, great, is being grateful? Grateful? If I did not have gratitude, I, I wouldn't be this kind of person. I am grateful for every breath that I take. And I'm not over-exaggerating that. I am grateful for the birds, for the sun. I think I've come to, so close to death so many times that I see how precious life is. And, I, and also, I, um, my years of nursing have taught me that, that people are not as healthy as I am. And the, the one thing that they, ha they have the most in life at the end of life when they're dying is regret. And they regret not being kind enough or not telling their kids enough that they love them or, or not doing this or not doing that. And I remember back when I was nursing, I'd say, I, I'm not going to live my life like that. I'm going to be grateful for every second that I have, everything that I do, every trip that I take, because... It could be gone in, in a second. It can be gone by the end of the day, right? And I really believe that having that gratitude and that love in my heart, um, it expands to everyone that comes around around who, around me and everything that I do, right? Kat, Kathy, is there a man in your life now? Nope. It's the first time in 50, in, in my, I'm 51 now that I'm single and I am so happy. <laughs> Right? So enjoying that freedom, huh? Yes, I'm financially stable. I own my own house. I got everything. You know, it's mine. No, I um in saying that, I did I was happily married for the last eight years and then something happened, but uh we split up. But I believe it, it's leading to other things because now um I was I'm 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 in Hollywood a lot. I, I've got some contacts, there's things that are coming up in my near future that kind of take me away from home anyway. So yeah, you got to stay tuned for that. I can't, I can't divulge it, but there's something coming. <laughs> so, you know, it's everything's for a reason. So. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, everybody. I want you to go get a <laughs> copy of dream big workbook. Um, she's going to give away the first chapter on fear and it's a workbook, you guys. I mean, it's a chance for you to um, pinpoint or, or yes. work through your fears and but read and the book first so you understand right the workbook so yeah. yeah read the book first and then go through the workbook yeah um i really enjoy talking with you uh i i gotta do the i gotta pay the okay. bills right now okay right. Kathy. so Bye. this episode <laughs> was brought to you by taxfreefuture.com if you don't have a tax deferred or uh, tax-free retirement plan in which to grow your finances or to grow your retirement or to become financially independent, then you have no idea the size of the tool you're missing in your tool belt. Please go to taxfeefuture.com, watch the 37 little video vignettes. You will not believe what your financial advisors are not telling you. We're gonna tell you what they're not telling you. We're gonna tell you why they're not telling you, and then you do with it what you want to, but you will be amazed. This is Mitch Steven with the Real Estate Investor Summit Podcast. I would like to thank everybody for coming out to get you some Kathy Chicaro. <laughs> <laughs> and to get you a copy of Dream Big Workbook and get you that chapter on fear and get your butt moving in the right direction. So, You're awesome. 
<laughs> so we're out of here. I hope everyone makes uh, makes a great week and, and finishes up the last half of this year. Man, time is flying. Half the year yeah. is already <laughs> practically gone. So uh, we're out of here. Bye, Kathy. Thanks so much. Bye. For being Thank on. you for having me. <laughs>